I invite you to turn with me to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to begin uh, reading um, at, uh, at verse 4 down to verse 17. Um, uh, please hear God's word. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. The Delium and Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush, and the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." Um, this morning I want to talk to you about being human. Uh, it's part two um, in a series of three, hopefully. Um, but in, uh, just by way of review, um, a couple weeks ago we began this um, uh, passage and uh, we've noticed that um, uh, Genesis 2 verse 4 is um, directly related to and parallel with Genesis 1, verse 1. They both give a summary statement of God creating the heavens and the earth. And so that leads us to see also that Genesis 2, verse 5 is parallel with Genesis 1, verse 2. In Genesis 1, verse 2, um, you know, it says that the earth was formless and uh, it was empty and it was, um, uh, it was uh, formless and empty. It was a desert waste. And what the Hebrew really means, it was unproductive. It was not producing anything. It was just uh, like a desert wasteland. And that's what you have here in chapter 2, verse 5, is that there's nothing springing up, there's nothing growing. Um, and, and the reason given, remember uh, what we talked about two weeks ago, the rationale here given is that the Lord God had not done something. God has to do something in order for there to be life, productivity, in order, in order for a desert to turn into an oasis. God must do something. And um, we saw in Genesis 1 uh, what God did do is that he spoke. And when he spoke, everything changed. And in this particular passage in Genesis 2, what's parallel to God speaking is God created a human being to whom he spoke. Remember Genesis 1, 28, that the Lord God made man and he spoke to him. In Genesis 1, 3, he spoke and things were created and formed and filled. And at the end of the creation in the sixth day, God started speaking to human beings, Adam and Eve. And so what we, what we gather from this 
is that and, you know, in order for the, uh, the world uh, to be productive and fruitful, what is necessary are spirit-filled, scripture-filled, Christ-focused people. If the world is ever to be a more beautiful place, a more productive place, what you need is a church. And so um, we often, you know, I know someone who takes pictures of landscapes and just loves to go out on days like today even and just take pictures of, of creation. But what this passage teaches us is that landscapes are incomplete, right? I mean, we often have these calendars that have all of these beautiful pictures of landscapes and canyons and hills and valleys and rivers and streams and beautiful mountains, but there's no people. <laughs> They're incomplete. In Isaiah 45, verse 18, uh, God specifically says, I did not create the world to be empty, but to be inhabited. And um, so when you look for calendars next year, <laughs> it's probably too late now, but get calendars that have landscape but have people inside of the pictures too. And uh, because God made this earth for you to live here, and no matter how beautiful the scenery might be, what actually makes the scenery beautiful is spirit-filled, scripture-filled, Christ-centered people functioning within that landscape. Isn't that right? And um, that's what you have here when God forms this man and uh, places him on uh, the earth. And in our particular passage for today, in verse 8, uh, it says, in verse 7 it says, um, um, God formed the man from the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And remember, that breath of life, that, that Hebrew phrase, is different from the breath of life found in animals. The Hebrew word used here for human beings is only used in the Bible for God's breath or the breath he gives to human beings. It's never used of animals, and so there's a difference. And so when you think about this in the whole scope of Scripture, it's so interesting to find that, that it says, in, in, remember in John 20, it says Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And all Scripture is breathed out by God. And so what is being referred to is, is a man, a woman, who is filled with God's word, filled with God's spirit, able to function for God's glory by emulating, reflecting who Christ is. Now this morning, I want us to focus on three things. And I don't know whether we'll get through them all, but it's okay. We can do it next week if we don't. Uh, that you were created uh, to long for God. That's what it means to be human. It means that you long for God. And uh, secondly, you were created to live with God. God made you to live with him. And, um, and you were also created to love God. What does it mean to be human? It means that you, you have a longing for God. It means that you dwell with God. And it means that you love God. And um, first, uh, you and I were created to long for God. Uh, look at what it says in verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, you know in the Bible when God wants to make a point, when he wants to emphasize something, he repeats himself. He didn't use Microsoft Word. He doesn't have boldface or italicize or underlining. The way he makes a point is he repeats himself. Because it probably would have been sufficient to say that God created a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man. That's enough. But he goes on to say, whom he had formed. Because there's a point that God is making, and it's, it's, it's um, developed a couple, other, couple times in Scripture, many times, but let's look at a couple. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse uh, 73, uh, it says, Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn your commandments. And so the psalmist makes a direct connection with having been fashioned and formed by God with this longing to live for God. And then um, in, verse, in, in, in Acts, uh, a, a passage that makes direct reference to our passage in Genesis 2, in Acts chapter 17. 
Acts chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse 24. Uh, Acts 17, 24, it says, The God who made the world and everything in it, uh, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hand, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. That's Genesis 2, 7. He gives us breath. And in verse um, 26 it says, And he made from one man, speaking of Adam obviously, every nation of mankind to live on all the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Now, it's interesting in this particular passage, uh, God is saying, if you've ever questioned this in your mind, uh, God is the one who has specifically determined that you would live. It's a blessing. Not only that, but he specifically determined when you would live. And he also specifically determined where, what zip code you would live. And, and he specifically determined uh, how you would live, seeking him. And, and also why, we'll see further in this passage, why you would live. Because God has, God has appointed a day in which he will judge all of us in righteousness by one man, another man, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And so this, this passage um, shows us, you know, just like God specifically determined Adam that he would live and when he, would de when he determined when he would make Adam, and he specifically placed Adam in the garden. Um, uh, and we'll see to work it and to keep it, to, to serve and to protect, to guard it. And, um, and that's also true of every one of us. When you think about the stars in the universe, and uh, there, are, there are billions of trillions of stars. We don't even know how many stars there are. Uh, Abraham was told to count them and, and had to be interrupted because there was just too many to count. But there are billions of trillions of stars. There's trillions of stars in this galaxy, but there's billions of galaxies that we know about. And there's trillions of trillions of stars in those galaxies. And, and why am I saying this? Because what's so amazing is that, that the Bible says every single star is unique. There's no two stars alike. And, and they're, they're all different. And God has given each one of those stars a name. Now that's profound. But what's even more profound is that is that God did not come technically uh, to die for stars. He came to die for you. And, and God has specifically determined that you would live, when you would live, where you would live, how you would live, and why you would live. And, um, and, and the reason he goes on to say is that you might seek God and perhaps feel after him and find him. You know, the Bible says in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 4, it says at uh, verse, beginning at verse uh, 29, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 29, but from there you will seek the Lord, your God. Um, he's just, the context is, is that God's people have been taken out into exile because of their sin and idolatry but they've, they've messed up terribly, they've gone away from God, and then God says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all of your heart and all of your soul. And uh, Jeremiah, uh, the Bible says in, in a very familiar passage in chapter 29, verse 11, that God says he knows the plans he has for his people, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope and then he goes on to say in verse 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And uh, so, so I would in, just commend to us this morning that, um, that God has placed you where you are right now uh, specifically that you might seek his face and find him 
not because he's lost, obviously, but like it says here, you would find him to be a God of mercy and a God of grace. It goes on in Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, verse um, 26 and following. It goes on to say in, in verse 30 of Acts 17, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so what, what, what's, what was true of Adam, what's true of you and I, is that God has specifically placed you in this world to seek his face so that you might not be ignorant of God, but be wise to God, that you would continue to live a life of turning to God, turning away from idolatry, and living for the service of the, of the true and living God. God has called us to live in order to serve Him. And God has determined that um, as, as, as our calling. Uh, I want to read to you a passage um, in 1 Chronicles. Uh, the book of 1 Chronicles. It's found in chapter 28. And it's verse 9. This is David uh, giving his charge to his son Solomon. Um, in First in Chronicles 28, verse 9, it says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the Lord of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. David is, is saying to Solomon that if you seek the Lord, you really seek him with all of your heart, he will be found by you. And uh, this, this particular morning, we come to this church, to come to this place, and everyone in here has longings in their heart. Everyone in here has burdens things going on in life that are sometimes way above your head. Some of you are worried about tests that you have to take and whether you're going to get into a particular school. Some of you are worried about whether you'll have a job next year. Or all kinds of things, whether your children will actually grow up to continue to love Jesus Christ. Whether your marriage will get mended or whether you'll even get married. We have all kinds of things that we, we worry about and are burdened about. And, and we have been placed in this world not to be anxious, not to stampede like a bunch of horses that are scared and spooked by something. We have been placed in this world by God. He has determined that you'd live, when you'd live, where you'd live how you'd live. And he specifically calls us to seek his face with all of our heart, with all of our mind, to live a life of seeking after God, seeking his will, seeking his kingdom, seeking his righteousness, seeking his face. On the back of the outline, the psalmist said in Psalm 27, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, that I might behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. The psalmist says that's the one thing I'm doing in this world as I'm seeking the face of God. Are, are, are you doing that today? Is, is the greatest longing of your heart to seek the face of God? Remember Jesus in Gethsemane? One of the most difficult moments in his life he had all these burdens in his heart and he expressed them clearly and transparently to God and he did it three times and after each time he, he ended that, that seeking and that longing with Lord not my will but let thy will be done. Is that the way you seek God? 
Or do you and I try to twist God's arm, manipulate him some kind of way so he'd open up his hand to us in a particular way? Are we, are we, are we seeking God or, or, or are we seeking something to get from God? There's nothing wrong with seeking stuff from God, but sometimes we, we use God like a candy machine. We just, we just use him to get what we want. And, and James, James says, you know, in James chapter 4, he says, you ask, but you don't have, because you ask amiss with wrong motives so that you can use it for your own pleasure. And, 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 and you and I are called to seek the face of God and to seek his will in our life. That's our calling. And, 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 and Acts goes on to explain how we're, we're called not to be ignorant of who God is, but we're called to live a life of repentance and righteousness because, because one day God, it's as if God is going to stand his, his Ten Commandments here and stand you next to them and see how you measure up to them. That he's going to judge you and I in righteousness one day and see how, in fact, we measure up to the rule of righteousness. And, and, if, and if I've been seeking God's face simply to get stuff from Him, using Him, manipulating Him, I'm not going to measure up too well. But if I've been honestly seeking God's face in repentance, wanting to turn to Him genuinely and turn from sin genuinely, to live a life of service for Him genuinely, then, then, then I'll measure up fine to the standard of righteousness. Because at the end of the day, you and I are responding to the grace of God. We're responding to the mercy of God. We're responding to the fact that He has given you life. And He has determined the allotted period in which you would live, and, and He determined the boundary where you would live, and he has, He's determined uh, how you would live, and He's enabled you to live that way by the power of His Spirit. Because not only did, did God take Adam and plant him in the garden for a specific purpose, but long after Adam, God planted another person. The Bible says at the fullness of time, at just the right time, at just the right place, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to live under the law of God, that standard of righteousness, and he lived perfectly under that law. Why did he do it? Because he loved his Father, of course. Because he glorified God, of course. His food was to do the will of him who sent me, but that wasn't the end of the story. He did it so that he might grant to you a perfect record of righteousness, a perfect record of obedience, he said that, that, let's exchange, give me your record of disobedience and you take my record of obedience. And so one day when, when you get judged and you get stood up next to the standard of righteousness, you'll be clothed in my perfect righteousness. And, and God will say to those who respond in grace to his mercy, he will say to those, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of of your master. There's, there's another garden city that you and I are headed for. Uh, it's called the new heaven and the new earth. It's, it's already begun in part because you're a new creation. But you and I are headed for another place that has streets, the Bible says, uh, made of gold. You know, you know, what we make streets out of today is, is not that really expensive stuff. It's really not worth a whole lot because they change it every year. They've got to dig it up and and repave it. And, and you're going to a place that, that is so bright and so beautiful that even the streets are made of gold. Even the gates are made of pearls because the most precious thing in that place is Jesus Christ. And, and the next best thing in that place is in fact uh, you, the church. You're his body and he counts you precious. He counts you valuable. He counts you special in his sight. And so, so when you consider the, the normal everyday activities that you're given, uh, go about those activities with a, with a sense of joy and a sense of gratitude and a, and, a, and a pep in your step, so to speak, a spring in your walk, because you know that you've been put here because God put you here. 
God determined that you'd live at this particular time and in this particular place so that you might seek his face, that you might turn to him daily, turn from sin daily, so that you might serve him and live for him as a response to the grace you have known in Jesus Christ. Because you know that on the day of judgment, when you get put up next to the standard of righteousness, you're going to like the way you look. God guarantees it because he's given you a robe of righteousness. And, and that, that fact, that the day of judgment, there's no condemnation for you. There's acceptance. There's welcome. There's access into the most holy place of all. We'll pick it up next week talking about that. But there's access to you. And so let that fact drive you today. That with the most important person in the universe... God loves you, accepts you, welcomes you, adores you, can't wait for you to be in glory with him. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father, in Christ's name, we do come and we give thanks to you for the fact that um, uh, you are sovereign. Uh, our life is not an accident. Uh, sometimes we wonder whether our life has been a waste. And you have said in your word it's not been a waste. Uh, we're not an accident. Uh, we're here on purpose. You placed us here. You determined that we'd be here at this particular time and in this particular place. And so, God, I pray that in every single thing, we would seek your face in all things and that we would seek your will in all things and we'd seek to serve you and to live a life of repentance and faith waiting for the great day, the glorious, majestic, splendid day when Christ himself will take us home to be with you. We bless and praise you. Give us grace each day to respond in our schoolwork, in our jobs, in all that we do, in our homemaking, in our single life, that we would constantly think about the day we will see you face to face. And may that day drive our life of service today.